News on the March presents RRM's review for the latest motion picture by David Fincher about the making of what many agree to be the greatest moving picture ever made. Stay tuned. What is up, everybody? Random Random Man here, bringing you another video during this current quarantine era. I hope everyone out there is continuing to stay safe and be well during this unpredictable time as I am here bringing you my review for Mank. Now the plot of this biographical drama basically follows our title character, who is nicknamed Mank, Herman J. Mankiewicz, played by Gary Oldman, a scathingly witty and alcoholic screenwriter who has been assigned with the task to write 1941's Citizen Kane. Going into this movie, it was my most anticipated film of 2020 that I knew was still coming out during this year as when it was announced to be happening, it was said that it was going to be given a release on Netflix, which is how I watched it last night. Now, there was a lot of excitement for me in anticipating this film. One reason being, and of course this is a big one, in it being about the making of, or at least the writing of, Citizen Kane. Now, to briefly go over my thoughts on this film, yes, a lot of people say it is the greatest film ever made. Well, regardless of whether or not people agree with that bold statement or not, I certainly have to say that it is undeniably one of the most important films in the history of American cinema for what Orson Welles was able to do behind and in front of the camera. With this being his first feature film, and he was given so much control for almost 80 years ago, which even today is almost unheard of within the studio system. But for me, do I on its own, aside from all of the many important and influential attributes this movie has, do I love it? Well, I gotta say yes. This film fascinates me in so many ways, way more than one, of course, given that I am personally a huge fan of film history. And so, of course, not only did I prepare myself for Mank by watching Citizen Kane, but also by watching Battle Over Citizen Kane, which a DVD copy came with in this Blu-ray digibook for the main film. This is the Oscar-nominated doc about the conflict between Orson Welles and newspaper mogul William Randolph Hearst, which Citizen Kane is so based off of. And like I said, with how fascinated I am with with the main film Citizen Kane, I found the battle over Citizen Kane to be fascinating too. Adding on to my anticipation for Mank was the fact that it was being directed by David Fincher, one of my absolute favorite filmmakers working in Hollywood today. This is his first feature film in six years as well. His first since 2014's Gone Girl, which <laughs> it's hard to imagine it's been that long since this film, as I vividly remember watching it in theaters back when we were still able to go. This is one of my favorite films films of that year. The only other two movies that Fincher made in the last decade were 2011's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which I thought was a great rendition of the story, even if I personally preferred the 2009 original Swedish version, but this is still by all accounts a great, great film. And 2010's The Social Network, which many consider to be one of the best films of the 2010s and i certainly have to agree and a lot of people have even said that it is very uh reminiscent of citizen kane in being a modern day version of it and having a lot of parallels to what Mark Zuckerberg and Charles Foster Kane did as characters. So it's only fitting that David Fincher would bring to life the making of Citizen Kane and he is doing so through a screenplay that was written by his late father Jack Fincher back in the 1990s. So with all of that coming together it looked like something that I would really dig. Starting out with the cast and their performances we have Gary Oldman in the title role of Mank, Herman J. Mankiewicz. Now, 
I think Oldman is one of the best actors working in Hollywood today, and he is personally my favorite male actor. And I was so unbelievably pleased to see him finally get Oscar gold with 2017's Darkest Hour for his amazing portrayal of Winston Churchill here. And I think that here in Mank, playing this very washed up and very bitter screenwriter, I think he gives one of the best performances of his in recent memory. Now, with what I've described of Mank, he is, at his core, an unlikable character. But he is somebody who I think is an interesting character to follow with how the movie is structured and along with Oldman's outstanding performance, of course. And I think that is what makes for a lot of the appeal and strong points of this movie right out of the gate. And this also applies with a lot of the supporting cast too. Amanda Seyfried plays Marion Davies, who is the real life mistress to William Randolph Hearst. And she is an actress who I've seen from time to time do more dramatic works like this one. But here, I gotta say, this is probably my favorite performance of hers. Like Oldman, she is really putting on a persona here of playing someone literally out of a different time. And the scenes that she has with Oldman's Mank together, I think create for one half of the heart of this movie, even when it does get into more of the dramatic stuff, like when uh, it comes up that there was a rumor for how Davies was the basis for the second wife of Charles Foster Kane in Citizen Kane, which Mank had said himself that he did not intend for, but that is up for you to decide both in real life and in the movie. Another strong female performance here comes from Lily Collins as Rita Alexander. She is the secretary for Mank, who is with him while he is at a commission in writing the screenplay for Kane. And I think she gives one of her better performances here as well. Collins as Alexander, I would say, is the other half of the heart of this film in connection to Mank as the main character, though their relationship is contentious at times in her caring for Mank while he is writing Kane. And I find it kind of funny that these two are more of the women in Mank's life compared to his own wife in the movie. Then there are the two supporting portrayals of the big real life figures here, William Randolph Hearst and Orson Welles. Hearst is played by Charles Dance and Wells is played by Tom Burke. Both of them are not in the movie for very long, but their brief screen time here in doses, I think adds on to the aesthetic of what is going on in the real life history of this film. And also with Burke specifically, he is almost uncanny to how he portrays Wells, both in appearance and voice. You hear him off screen quite a bit in this film and I just thought, wow. <laughs> There's also the portrayal of various famous Hollywood figures from this era of time, like David O. Selznick, Louis B. Mayer, Irving Thalberg, Joseph L. Mankiewicz, the younger brother to Mank, who himself is a famous movie director, and there's also Charles Lederer, the niece to Marion Davies. Even a crazy cameo that I personally had spoiled for myself, but You'll know him when you see him if you really look closely. And let me just say that the actor who plays him knows quite a bit about science. But with everyone here in this stacked ensemble, I think they give exceptional performances with a particular note going to Oldman and Seyfried. The writing of this film, as I said, was done by Jack Fincher, the late father to David Fincher, and it is so clear from the get-go that it is structured like Citizen Kane in it being set up in the present day, but told through flashback throughout. The way the movie starts out, it starts at Manx Ranch home where he has suffered a broken leg after a car accident and he has been tasked with writing Citizen Kane from Orson Welles himself. And across the movie, we get flashbacks throughout the 1930s with Manx time at MGM and also just going through various parts of history. With this approach, I thought that Fincher had quite an inspired eye, or I should say hand, in being able to tell the story in a lot of the same framework and callbacks to Citizen Kane. And this is applicable to a lot of what is portrayed here in me viewing a lot of the film history and seeing so many figures here just 
being talked about, seen, or even referenced all around. And with how the movie does play out too, in the way it does ebb and flow, and how David Fincher directs it, he indeed directs it with a sure and steady hand to where he is lovingly tributing movies from this time and the era of filmmaking, the golden age of Hollywood during the 1930s and 1940s to a T to where I was eating it up all the way. This brings me to some of the technical elements here, which include, but are not limited to, the cinematography, which I thought was spectacularly stylish in being done in black and white while shot on digital. This movie wasn't shot on film, but I'm not a stickler for noticing intricacies or calling out certain parts of how a movie looks visually and that, oh, it could have been done better if it was authentically shot in the original format it is trying to imitate. No, I thought the movie looked stellar either way with some little nice details in here like uh, blotches of black circles all around and just the overall aesthetic still made me feel like I was back in this time period, the way it is edited. Very similarly, again, to how Citizen Kane was edited with a lot of the transitions in between scenes fading in and fading out out like an old style film and even when we get into the flashbacks it is presented to us with title cards typed out by a typewriter with the same kind of text. The production design and all around values for this movie aesthetically just mwah, chef's kiss all around with how the movie is designed. The costumes, the locations, and us looking at the studio system within MGM, the home of Mang, and even once we get to San Simeon, the large, large home of William Randolph Hearst, it was all so eye-catching to look at in me feeling like I was peering into a window of the past with my 65-inch TV within my living room. Speaking of my in-home viewing format too, I also want to get into to some of the sound as well because I have a pretty good sound system in my home with concert style speakers. As soon as I heard the dialogue of this movie be spoken, I had to crank it all the way up, not because I wasn't understanding it, but because I noticed that it was done in mono with a similar effect to how microphones were used back during the eras that are portrayed in this film. They were more sensitive than they are now, which I thought was such a neat touch, as when hearing some of the accents of the characters, like transatlantic style accents, or just talking in this manner, it all around made me feel more so I was in the movie. And then this also goes into the original score by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. These are longtime collaborators of David Fincher. And here they were tasked with doing a score that was reminiscent of what Bernard Herrmann did with Citizen Kane's score almost 80 years ago. They even made it a point to limit themselves in using instruments that were available to them in the eras that this movie is set in. So I thought that was a neat, neat touch here. And as for the score itself, it really did feel like I was back in a film that is almost film noir-esque or centric like it, which is fitting as well because Citizen Kane went on to inspire a lot of film noirs that were in a similar style to the way it was shot and composed altogether. So it's pretty clear by now that I am gushing over this movie and that I loved it. Oh yeah, I would say that I am in the camp that has enjoyed this movie more than most. And I bring this point up now because I want to be crystal clear in saying that this is a film that is not for everyone. I can see more traditional audiences not being into this movie in saying it is boring, cold, dull, or emotionally distant. And I actually think that is not dissimilar to how some people today may feel about Citizen Kane as there is a certain kind of appeal associated with that film and with Mank because both movies are so closely connected together. It's like Mank has expected the viewer to have watched Citizen Kane prior to it. And I am one of the people that did so in addition to the battle over Citizen Kane to get more of the real life history with the making of that film and the two central figures fighting over it. 
So in that sense, that is partially why I was into this movie more than most, or at least I expect to be into it more than most people that eventually end up watching it. So in other words, it's super niche and acquired taste associated with it is going to hold back some audiences from really getting into it as much as myself or other uh, film buffs and film historians out there. And I will admit that this film isn't without some fault. I'm not saying that this movie is a total work of art. I think that the main issue I have with it, in connection to being a film that is paralleling Citizen Kane a lot, more so goes into the third act of the film. Without giving much away, I would say that the scene that involves a drunken mank going off on a rant while being juxtaposed with another moment in the film that does have to do with it in real life, I think could have been either cut down or more so edited and paced in a way to where it wasn't so in your face to where, yeah, this is where it's all coming to a head. It almost felt like it was rushed and coming together right then and there towards the end to where, yeah, this is what led up to uh, Mankiewicz and Wells both being credited as co-authors for Citizen Kane's script. That is also the point where I felt the pacing of the movie hitched up a little bit to where, yeah, I felt it could have been tightened up or streamlined a little more, but the rest of the movie structurally was already so uh, in tune in paralleling Citizen Kane as a movie that, yeah, that was only just one aspect that I didn't feel wasn't as pristine as I feel the rest of the movie is. But as I said, I really did love this movie. Again, I can see the appeal of this movie being really low or really high for those like myself who are already versed or really into the history and appeal of Golden Age Hollywood, specifically in the 1930s and 1940s. For everyone else, though, you really have to know what to expect going in. Like fans of David Fincher who are more used to what he has done in the last decade or just the style of filmmaking he's usually associated with will be thrown for a loop in not knowing what to expect for this movie in it being so unique and I think really a standout moment in his filmography because he is not just tributing Golden Age Hollywood. He's also tributing his father in bringing his script to life. And I think that deserves a lot of merit too. And with all of what I have said and more with Mank, it is undoubtedly one of my favorite movies of 2020 thus far. I highly recommend it, but for everyone else, know what to expect and temper your expectations. My final verdict. For Mank is four and a half out of five stars. Thank you all, as always, for watching. Be sure to like this video, comment on what you thought of Mank. Social media links in the description. Subscribe to my channel for more, and I'll catch you on the next movie review.